Thank you very much. I unfortunately do not have any financial interest to disclose. So just a little bit about cancer survivorship. Currently, cancer survivors represent about 4% of our, our population, and, and this is only continuing to grow. Um, and 64% of survivors have survived five or more years after diagnosis, 41% 10 years or more. And uh, as our therapies get better for cancer, we're going to have more and more patients surviving cancer, which is great. Um, but there are consequences of the chemotherapies and radiation therapies, and many of those are, are cardiac. So, for example, childhood survivors of cancer are eight times more likely to die of heart disease and 15 times more likely to experience heart failure than their contemporaries who do not have cancer. So this is really um, going to be an overwhelming problem, um, as it already is and will continue to be so. For example, in breast cancer, uh, typically um, after the first several years of, of therapy, cardiovascular disease becomes the number one cause of death in survivors of, of breast cancer. So the, the cardiovascular complications of chemotherapy are, are many and, and numerous, and they're not just limited to, to heart failure and LV dysfunction. Um, there's various different ways that chemotherapy is going to affect the cardiovascular system. This first slide represents the ways that it can cause LV dysfunction. And looking at the types of chemotherapies, it's not just adriamycin or Herceptin, which you see here, um, but you see a number of other agents, alkylating agents, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, et cetera, that can also cause LV dysfunction. But in addition, we have chemotherapies that can cause ischemia, with 5-FU being the, the prototypical agent that most of us have, are aware of. But there's also many other agents that can do so as well. And in addition, we have chemotherapies, uh, especially the, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are markedly associated with hypertension. And uh, this is something that all cardiologists should be aware of, because you may be seeing these patients and wondering why their blood pressure, which has been controlled on 5 of amlodipine for several years, all of a sudden is spiking and, and unable to be controlled on multiple agents. And then also there's chemotherapies associated with, with venous thromboembolism, with bradycardia, with QT prolongation. And so there really are an enormous set of cardiovascular complications that can occur with, with various chemotherapies, and um, it's a, a lot to, to keep up with. So anthracyclines represent the, the class of medications that, that's most um, commonly researched, and that's because it's one of the most common chemotherapies used. It's used uh, ubiquitously in lymphomas, leukemias, breast cancers, and, and other malignancies. So it's a very effective chemotherapy, um, but, but it does have an association with clinical heart failure. Um, and, that, and that percent of, of how frequent that is, the prevalence is difficult. To, uh, the studies are a little bit uh, all over the map in terms of what that range is. But it does range, at least for symptomatic clinical heart failure, up to 5%. Asymptomatic heart failure as high as 26%. And this does depend on the dose. The higher the dose, the, the greater the risk, especially once you get over 250 milligrams per meter squared. But you can have heart failure even at doses that are smaller than that. This is a more contemporary look at the incidence of, of chemotherapy cardiotoxicity from adriamycin. And this is from a, a study in Italy. Um, uh, first, Arthur is a Cardinale, and, and she's done a lot of the, 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 really a lot of the great research in this field in the last 10 years. And they took uh, over 2,000 patients that were getting chemotherapy for either breast cancer or for non-Hodgkin's disease. And they were eliminated patients that were getting high-dose anthracyclines or that were getting concomitant HER2 antagonists, which can also amplify the, the, the heart failure incidence. And they found that out of these patients, which are patients that are not high-risk patients that are coming in, average age is around 50 in both groups, and about one in four will have hypertension. About 9% of these patients had cardiotoxicity. And out of the breast cancer group, it was almost 10%. And these are typically uh, relatively healthy women um, that have few, few comorbidities. And what was interesting, because uh, often we'll see patients with cardiotoxicity that develop or that are found years later, in this group, uh, the, the overwhelming majority was discovered in the first year. 98% occurred within the first year. And one hypothesis for why this is so staggeringly different from 
what literature we have is because now we're doing not only more sophisticated screening, but more frequent screening of these patients. And if you look at the average cumulative dose of those that had cardiotoxicity, it was about 360 milligrams per meter squared with a range of 170. Um, uh, so it's really um, more common if you look, and it often it can be early. The risk factors for anthracycline cardiotoxicity, what is known is that cumulative dose, as I mentioned, the, um, the, the age at diagnosis, so extreme age, less than four years old, greater than 65 years old, is associated with a higher risk. Um, women are associated with a higher risk. And not only the individual dose, but the, the, how you deliver it, there's some evidence to suggest that if you give it by continuous infusion, you might decrease the risk. Um, concomitant radiation therapy or other uh, cardiotoxic chemotherapies also increase the risk. And then pre-existing cardiovascular risk factors, while there's not a lot of known evidence on how much those additional risks carry, that we, we do um, think that hypertension and, and other cardiovascular risk factors will contribute. And certainly having a low EF or family history um, may also contribute. So how do we screen and, de and detect anthracycline cardiotoxicity? The American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Heart Association, Heart Failure Society, et cetera, they all recommend serial assessment of your LV function, but none of them will recommend specifics in terms of how often and, and with what modality. Um, echocardiography uh, really has been used a lot more frequently than MUGA over the last 10 years, and I would advocate for that approach. Um, the benefits are that there's no radiation, it's, it's cheaper. In addition to just the ejection fraction and volume, you'll get additional information such as diastolic dysfunction, hemodynamics, valvular disease. And on top of that, there's newer techniques with ECHO that are additive to predict cardiotoxicity, namely strain imaging and 3D volumetrics. Uh, the, the limitations of ECHO, and, and you know, I do have some oncology colleagues that will call me and say, you know, this guy's EF was 50% last week and someone got another echo, now it's 45% or 55%, what's going on? And nothing's changed, it's just a different person reading it often. And so there is a 5 to 10% inter-observer variability. Um, and uh, one limitation of echo is that having an abnormal EF is typically a late finding. <coughs> So strain imaging is something that's been uh, helpful to, to predict the onset of cardiotoxicity for those unfamiliar with strain. It's a dimensionless index that reflects the total deformation of the, of the ventricular myocardium during the cardiac cycle as a percentage of the initial length. And the change in global, there's, you could have strain as in the top in longitudinal strain, radial strain, circumferential strain. Longitudinal strain has really been predictive in, in this field, and changes in the global longitudinal strain typically occur before the onset of LD's, the LV dysfunction, a cutoff of about negative 18 with higher negative numbers um, being normal, so negative 20 being normal. And you see in this example, it drops to negative 17, which is a 15% um, drop, and the EF is still preserved. And you, if you were just looking at EF, you wouldn't appreciate that. But then subsequently, you'll see the EF drop. So this might be a target to try to treat people here and prevent the development of, of, of a drop in EF. And that's ongoing data to evaluate that, uh, that hypothesis. And this, uh, just in terms of the predictive value of strain, just to highlight that the negative predictive value is very good with a modest a positive predictive value. And biomarkers, um, and just, you know, BNP has is, is really been pretty variable in the literature to, to predict cardiotoxicity. Troponin has had more success. Um, as high as 30% of patients on high-dose chemotherapy will have a persistent troponin elevation. And this study looked at those patients, and they randomized those that had a persistent troponin elevation to usual therapy, meaning placebo and, and nothing, versus an ACE inhibitor. So if you see on, on the, the, white, uh, the white boxes are those that, uh, that had a positive troponin, and the blacks are those that uh, did not have a positive troponin. If you randomize them to here, if you, if you had them on placebo, those with the positive troponin would subsequently drop their EF. But if you took those same patients and put them on a nalpril, then they maintain their ejection fraction. And if you look at those that had cardiovascular events, the ACE group had almost no cardiovascular events versus um, a high number of events 
in the troponin groups that were not randomized to an ACE inhibitor. So troponin can be helpful, and early treatment is helpful. If you put these patients on goal-directed therapy uh, and, and within six months of, the chemo, of their uh, chemotherapy, then you have a chance to reverse their cardiomyopathy. Now, according to this data, um, if you wait till after six months, there's, uh, none of these patients improve their cardiomyopathy, but at least um, clinically, I can say that we have patients that have been treated six months afterwards and have had recovered EF, so th th we'll take this with a little grain of salt. In terms of what we can do for primary prevention, uh, this is uh, one of the trials looking at dexrazoxane, which is a cardioprotective agent. It's an iron chelator that prevents the formation of anthracycline iron complexes and the generation of free radicals. FDA restricts this to adults with metastatic breast cancer who have already received uh, over 300 of doxorubicin or 540 of epirubicin, and it showed to decrease cardiovascular events in this cohort. So moving on to other types of agents, um, HER2 antagonists um, are, are agents that uh, are increasingly used. About 20% of patients with breast cancer will overexpress human epidermal growth factor 2, which is associated with a worse prognosis. And they've monoclonal antibodies to HER2 antagonists, such as trastuzumab or Herceptin, have led to a paradigm shift in the treatment and have been used increasingly in the adjuvant setting. And now there are newer agents in this field that uh, you can see here, uh, including pertuzumab and lapitinab, which have been developed recently. And this is already an old slide, 10 years now, and, but looking back towards 2007, you can see the use of these agents was on the rise and it's only getting um, more common. Herceptin toxicity is, is classified as a type 2 toxicity as opposed to type 1 toxicity of adriamycin, which is uh, supposed to be irreversible. Type 2 cardiotoxicity is typically reversible and without myocyte necrosis. However, there's about up to 20% of patients with Herceptin cardiotoxicity do not respond to therapy and are, are really not reversible. On the flip side, we see that patients with adriamycin cardiotoxicity can be reversible if they're on the right therapy. So these paradigms are not uh, completely accurate. So usually with Herceptin cardiotoxicity, if you, if you stop the therapy and combine them with goal-directed medical therapy, you can recover their EF. The incidence was as high as 27% in the initial trials when they were used at the same time as anthracyclines. But now that the, when you use them uh, temporarily uh, apart, they, the incidence is lower. And, but if you look at what happens in the real world outside of trials, um, a lot of these patients were excluded for the trial. So real-world database of Medicare women over 65, and you see um, much as Dr. Drasner highlighted in terms of as we age, the incidence of heart failure is already high, 7% in this group. But if you look at those that were on trastuzumab, it doubled the incidence of heart failure, and anthracyclines had a significant increase as well. So one year and two year as well. So, so a lot of these patients were excluded from the trials. And the novel agents, um, just briefly, they've had a more favorable cardiotoxic profile um, than, than Herceptin so far. But the, again, these are carefully selected patients, and time will tell after uh, further data. So moving on to, to one other type of, of chemotherapy that are, is commonly used, uh, TKIs and VEGF inhibitors, their incidence also is much higher in the real world versus the initial studies. If you look at um, heart failure in the, in the dark blue, um, the incidence for all of these patients is about 14%, which is about five-fold higher than it was in the literature when these drugs came out. So it's just something to be aware of that these patients also need careful attention. Uh, they also get a lot of hypertension, and they need to be treated. And then uh, finally, these new drugs, immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, I don't know if some of you may have seen a recent New England Journal of Medicine article about this, but this is a billion-dollar industry, as you can see. This are monoclonal antibodies targeted to, to, uh, to allow T cells to, to fight cancer. And there was just a paper that came out that if you use these drugs in a combination form, that uh, there's some, uh, there were two known incidences of fatal and fulminant myocarditis, and looking back at a database, incidence is, is about 0.27% uh, for myocarditis. It's just something to be aware of. As our drugs get more sophisticated, uh, cardiovascular uh, side effects will always be there, and it's something to be looking out for. And uh, in the interest of time, we will wrap up. And um, just, to, you know, we're looking at 
um, using strain and biomarkers here and also studying some novel biomarkers, um, nanopeptide biomarkers and gene expression profiles that we're hoping can also be predictive. And um, just to conclude, uh, as um, the number of cancer survivors incre increase, there will be an increase in can cardiac side effects from cancer-related therapies. Anthracyclines are a common cause of chemotherapy cardiotoxicity, but if they're detected and treated early on, patients can recover. Echo with strain imaging and possibly troponin are currently the best methods for cardiotoxicity detection, but newer biomarkers are needed. And HER2 antagonists are cause a typically but not always reversible cardiomyopathy, and emerging data suggests that their newer agents may be less cardiotoxic, and uh, the cardiotoxicity of newer agents were underestimated in initial trials. And with that, I'll uh, take some questions. Thank you.